Okay, grab your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. If you've been here for the last 14 months, you're shocked. We're not in Psalms? No, we're done with Psalms. We're going to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 today for our last worship service in 2015. Maybe there's some family here still hanging around. Family members, we're glad that you're visiting with us today. Maybe there's still some college students here on break. We're glad you're here, college students. Uh, we, we do have some high school and junior high students in with us today because they've canceled those normal teen services. So welcome, everybody. Junior hires, try to focus like me, all right? Oh, thank you. You guys are already laughing a little bit more than that group over there. I don't, they had too much turkey. They're Gonesville over there, all right? But I'm glad that you're here today, and I'm glad that we're going to study together the Word of God. We've spent much of the last year, as I've said, in the book of Psalms, and we've learned a lot about worship. The, the whole book is about praises, and uh, so we've learned about the God of the praise. We, we've said this over and over again. There is one worthy of worship. It's him. It's the Lord. It's God. And we've learned why. He's our shepherd. He's the creator. He's the Lord of all. He has all power. His word is life-changing. He is eternal. He's our savior. His steadfast love for us endures forever. Wouldn't you agree? He's the one that's worthy of praise. Hopefully today, we have focused on him. Every song, every prayer, Everything we've done in here is about him, right? We've also learned that beyond the who of worship, there's how of worship. There's a lot of ways to worship. Did you know that? We've learned that in this ancient hymn book, 3,000-year-old book of the Jewish people as they came together to worship, we've learned uh, how to worship. You can worship in a variety of ways. You can stand up. You can sit down. You can lay down on your face. You can raise your hands, you can hold your hands out, you can raise them high, you can, you can uh, bow your head, you can raise your head, you can look up, you can look down, you can look around. Any way you want to, you can praise the Lord. And we often do that through music. We point out the ancient people of God express their innermost feelings about God through music in a lot of different instruments. You can do it loud with you know, clanging cymbals and drums and just y- screaming out, you know, this joyful noise. Ah, that's praising the Lord if you're directing it to him, right? Otherwise, you're in pain. Sorry, I got distracted by my sound. Uh, you, you can sing, you can reflect, you can use stringed instruments and flutes and pipes to be very quiet. You can clap, you can jump, you can pause. There's a lot of ways to praise the Lord that are right, and hopefully we've experienced most of these in the last year because he is worthy of all of it. Amen? And once again, I just want to say this. If you're a member of Eastview Christian Church, I'm super proud of you for sticking with this for 14 months because now we have a basis of understanding what it means to really praise the Lord and understand what it really means to worship. But we've come to one last worship service, the Sunday after Christmas, and uh, there's a bunch of leftovers in your house, and there's a bunch of broken stuff already, and there's so many boxes you don't know what to do with them. And we don't have anything else to say with, from Psalms. We have squeezed Psalms as much as we possibly can. But today, unbelievably, in the book of Romans, chapter 12, there are two verses that talk about one last worship service, the service that we give of our lives every day to God. And so we're going to read this together, and we're going to pray that the Lord speaks to us today. There's other ways to worship God besides music and praying and posture and the worshipy things we think about when we come to church. And that is the worship service that is daily and the worship instrument of ourselves. So let's read this together. We've got a great challenge, and then um, we'll see what God does, all right? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. Let's pray. God, I pray just like I did last evening in this place that you would come in here because you knew who would sit where. You know how many hairs are on our heads. You know what's in our heart. You know what we're worried about. You know what we've come from. You know whether Christmas was good or bad. You know if our trees are still up or not. And you know what you want to accomplish in us. And so I pray today, Father, that every person from junior high all the way to 95 years old will listen to your voice. And then, in fact, God, you'll do what only you can do, that you'll speak in a powerful way by your word and by your spirit that will change us 
God, I hope this is not just another go to church Sunday after Christmas, but you'll really do something in us that, that we'll walk away going, that was great because we heard from God. So, Lord, would you give me the words and guide my heart by your spirit, help me to follow him as I preach. Speak to us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Well, believe it or not, these two verses are about worship service. There's no singing. There are no instruments. There's no clapping. There's no shouting out to the Lord. But these two verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2, are about a worship service that we are a part of if we are followers of Jesus Christ. The kind of praise and the kind of instrument that God really wants is our daily life and our life presented to him. Now, uh, Paul spends the biggest part of this, this letter. If you, if you understand the book of Romans, we call it the book of Romans, but it was a letter to real Christians who lived in the first century in Rome. Hey, you guys are sharp. All right. These are Roman Christians. Paul writes them a long letter. He spends the first of what we call, remember there were no numbers when he wrote it. It was on a scroll. The first 11 chapters that we have, Paul spent a lot of time telling them about God, how good God was, how he saved people from their sins, how he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he, he talks about all the God stuff, all the theology, all the doctrine. Tons of books and tons of uh, Bible college classes are taught on the first 11 chapters. Then in verse 12, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, okay, in light of all that stuff, or what he says, I appeal to you, therefore... So he's been talking for 11 chapters. He says, because of that, this. Because of all that is true, by the mercies of God, I want you to live this way. And that's what our reasonable act of worship is. In light of all the God stuff and all the God realities, your life should be a daily worship service. The instrument of praise should be your life and the life that you have to live. Worship is about becoming, what's he say here? Living sacrifices. Now, before I get to living sacrifices, because that's enough to talk about for a long time, before I get there, let me just say this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by what? By the mercies of God. I want you to understand that everything I'm telling you to do today, you can only do because God has been merciful to you through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way this works. This separates Christianity from all other world religions. Every other world religion says you sacrifice, you live, you do, and maybe one of our gods likes you. Maybe one of our gods shows you mercy, doesn't kill you, doesn't strike you with lightning because they're powerful. Only the God of Christianity, the God of the Bible says, I've already given you mercy. You're going to be good because I've already loved you so well that you want to. We're not trying to earn anything from God because we can't. Okay? We are doing everything I'm going to tell you today because it's going to sound very much like a 2016 resolution sermon. We're doing all of this in light of the mercies that God has already given us. We can't earn it. It's a gift. And that brings us then to this really cool idea of presenting your bodies as living sacrifices. See the word there? Present your bodies as living sacrifice. Literally bring them down in your hands. That's what they did in the Old Testament. You guys know the Old Testament stuff, right? There were all kinds of rituals. They came often. When they came to church like you did this morning, they brought animals. They were sacrifices. They were oxes and donkeys and lambs and sheep, and they brought these animal sacrifices. The oxymoron of this teaching is he wants you to be living sacrifices. One thing we know about sacrifices, when you come to the altar, it's over. No, literally. That's how they started. They cut the juggler vein, and then they burned it on the altar. And so if you could experience an Old Testament worship service today, you would, you would experience death on an altar being burnt before the Lord. Okay? So Paul says, living sacrifices. Or as the old preacher said back in the 60s, I remember this as a kid, it's been said of your eggs and bacon breakfast, chickens give an offering, pigs make a sacrifice. Right? Pigs <laughs> die for your eggs and bacon. All right? Praise God that they do. All right? But the point is, is that when you come to be a sacrifice in the Old Testament days, you die. What does he mean that we would be living sacrifices we don't literally kill ourselves? No, he's saying you die to yourself. You get up on the altar, you present yourself to me, and you die to your life so that you can live for me. Paul says this is the thing that's holy and acceptable. I want you to see something about offerings here. Just at the very beginning, as we offer living sacrifices before God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. The word holy there sounds very church-like, and if you're not a church person, you go, oh, it's holy. It's very sacred, very special. 
And you're getting close to what the word means. The word holy literally means to set apart for some special purpose. But we just, bless you. We just went through the Christmas holiday season. You guys have all used some holy stuff. I guarantee you that in your mom's house or your grandma's house, there is some china that you ate on this Christmas that you will not eat on again until next Christmas. It's Christmas china. We have some in our house. So we, we got it out. We washed it because it's been sitting there for a year. And then we ate on it and we washed it and we stuck it again in a special cabinet in our house. It is holy. It is set aside. You don't go in the middle of July and grab one of those dishes and microwave something. It is set apart as holy only for Christmas. We have mugs that are that way. We have dishes that are that way. We have decorations that are that way, right? You just don't get out of strand of lights in the middle of July and say, I think I'm gonna make my room. You don't do that. They're set apart for holy. God says, if you wanna understand sacrifices, you set something apart as holy. You dedicate it to me. That's what Paul's saying. We present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. If you read the book of Malachi, about 400 years before Jesus came into the world as a baby, the Jewish people had kind of missed this holy and acceptable sacrifice thing because they were bringing God something else. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, or if you're from Italy, Malachi uh, is the name of the prophet. Thank you. I don't care if you think it's funny. I think it's hysterical. <laughs> Malachi. Ah. In Malachi 1, verse 6, he gives us insight into the kind of offerings the people were bringing to God. They were bringing polluted food instead of their best grains. They were bringing blind animals. They were bringing lame animals. They were bringing sick animals. Even though God had said to them, hey, when you have a crop, I want the first fruits of that crop. Hey, when you have animals born, I want the firstborn. Hey, when you have animals that you're gonna sacrifice to me, I want the very best of your flocks and your herds. You know what God says in Malachi 1 through the prophet Malachi? He says, I wish y'all would stop coming to church. You're wasting time. You're bringing me your leftovers. I don't like leftovers. I want what's first. You set something apart to me as holy and you bring it. I wonder if God would look at our souls in 2015. He says, you brought me a bunch of leftovers last year. I don't know if you like leftovers at all. Our house, we don't like leftovers very much, but I bet you got some at your house. Tupperware containers full of stuff shrapnel of pies and cookies left on your counter, right? headless gingerbread men, it's tragic, all kinds of turkey dishes and ham dishes, you're just trying to recreate the same old stuff over and over again. I don't know if you like leftovers, but I know what the scripture says, God doesn't like leftovers. If you're gonna worship him, if you're gonna be the kind of people who give a spiritual act of worship through your daily lives, our daily offering to God is saying, God, first and foremost, you have me, all of me. We don't come before the Lord and say, hey God, I'm at church, but I'm gonna focus on my work this week and then I'll give you whatever else I can. Hey, I'm raising kids right now, I need to focus on my young children and then I'll give you whatever else I can after that. Hey, I've got this boyfriend or this girlfriend and I wanna focus on this relationship, whatever's left, I'll give it to you. Hey God, you know, it's a stage of life, I really gotta crack down and get some more in my savings so I can retire. But after that, when I retire, I'll give you more. And God says, keep it. I don't want your leftovers. I want you and I want all of you first and foremost in 2016. Matthew 6, says it this way, Jesus speaking, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all this other stuff, you'll get that too. Just pay attention to me first. I want to be first. So in 2016, I want to challenge all of us at Eastview Christian Church and those visiting with us to focus on two words that he uses here in this passage that will help us be living sacrifices. The first word is the word conformed. You see it there? That this will guide us as we decide how we're gonna live out 2016. Do not be conformed to this world. It's a really long, like five syllable Greek word. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it, it's too close to Christmas, okay? But the word has the word scheme, schema in it. It's the word we get schematics from. Some of you guys had schematics for the stuff that you're supposed to put together for your children on Christmas. Slot A, you know, nut B into bolt A, and I mean, all these, these different schematics. Usually I just threw those things away and just kind of faked my way through it. 
But if you really want to put something together, you follow the pattern, you follow the form, you follow what's written down, and if you follow that, you can build what they're telling you to build. It'll look the same. Paul says that the world has a schematic. The world has instructions. The world has a pattern, and you should, if you want to live for God, not be conformed to that. You should not follow that pattern, the the pattern of this world. There's a lot said in the scripture about the world or this age is what this word literally means. But listen to some of the the words about what's happening to this word. Why not conform to this world? Well, here's some reasons. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. So we live in a world where Satan is trying to blind people from the truth of God's word. We go on uh, in uh, Galatians 1, 4, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. It's an evil world. It's a world that's blinded, and if you follow the schematics of the world, you're you're gonna follow a blind guide. And it's an evil world. If you follow the schematics of the world, it's gonna be evil and bad things are gonna happen. Why do bad things happen in the world? Because the devil is in the midst of it, and it's an evil world because he runs it. You know, every time something bad happens, people want to go, oh, God's not a very loving God. No, Satan's a very mean uh, opponent of God. And you should blame him. And if you don't believe in God, then you don't believe in Satan, and it doesn't matter. Good luck. Okay? But this is a present evil age. And one other thing that I need to share with you is that the present form of this world is passing away, it says in 1 Corinthians 7.31. The world is passing away. It's evil. It's blinding us to what's real, and it's passing away. So as Christians, followers of God, we should not be conformed to the pattern of this world. You don't believe the world's passing away? Quick, what did you get last Christmas? Most of you have no idea it's how important it is. Because it was just cool last year, and now a year later it's passed away. It's probably gone. You probably put it in a garage sale, right? It's over. The world is passing away. And so here's what he says, listen, don't conform to this world that's evil and passing away and blinding us. Don't be conformed to this world by presenting uh, your bodies to something other than what you're supposed to present to. See the same word here that says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He also uses that same word earlier in the letter in Romans 6.13. He says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness. In other words, you can present your bodies as living sacrifices or you can present your bodies as as members of sin. What does this present age offer? Can we just take a moment, as I just see it, there's three things that I think that this this present scheme, this present pattern of the culture we live in, and by the way, this is so easy because if you go back to first century Rome, they were dealing with the same things. Isn't it amazing? Satan is mean, but he's not very smart. He uses the same tactics over and over and over again. And, and, and you might go, well, how do you know that they were dealing with this in, in, uh, in the first century in Rome? Well, because Paul's writing to first century Roman Christians. It's the same stuff we deal with. He, he, here's, here's the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world says, give in to all sensual pleasure. That's, that's not just sexual. It can be sexual. But basically, we live in a culture that says, whatever your senses want to experience that you like, do it. If you want to look at something, look at it. If you want to hear that, hear that. If you want to say that, say that. If you want to feel it, then feel it. Whatever your senses say is pleasurable to you, do it. Have sex with anybody you want to. Seek thrills and adventure. Have drugs and drunkenness. Eat as much as you possibly can. Collect a bunch of material goods as a way to fulfill fulfill your soul. Listen, take this down. God never intended for humans to pattern their lives on their senses. Never. He gave you your senses to experience the good stuff he wants to give you. He doesn't want you to pattern your life and make major decisions based on, wow, that feels good. Wow, that looks good. Wow, that sounds good. But that's what the world does. And if we conform to that, we are going to be off target in following God. The second thing is this, follow your emotions. We live in this sensual world that says whatever sense is good, follow that. Other people say follow your emotions. What you feel is what's right. How you feel is the truth. Some of you have probably said this before. I don't know if it's right or wrong. It's how I feel. We have emotions. We're happy. We're sad. And this world says whatever makes you happy is what you should do. It's what's right for you. If you feel like you're falling in love, then fall in love and do whatever comes natural. And if you feel like you're falling out of love, then do whatever that result is. 
Someone makes you mad, avoid them. Someone makes you sad, avoid it. Something makes you glad, indulge in it. It's really simple. Whatever you feel, you just respond. But all of us should understand very clearly that because we have the capacity to have like seven emotions in one day, it's not a very good guide through life. In fact, God never intended for humans to pattern their lives on their emotions. It would be a very herky-jerky path. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm discouraged, I'm embarrassed. What are you? Your emotions change. He didn't give us emotions to pattern our lives in. And then he finally didn't give us this collective cultural wisdom. That's the other pattern, the wisdom of this culture. What's the wisdom of this culture? Whatever a bunch of people vote as yes. Whatever people like, whatever people favorite, whatever people, uh, you know, whatever goes viral, how, how many views it gets, then it becomes true. We live in a culture that if you could get a million people to say something that's not true is true, then it becomes true. It's collective cultural wisdom. And here's just what you need to understand, especially if you're young in here. God never intended for humans to pattern their lives on the opinions of other flawed humans. If you're here today and you're a teenager or college age, let's let me give you some wisdom from a 50-year-old dude, all right? Your friends aren't that smart. There's not. They got a lot to say. They got a lot of opinions. There's not that smart. So if you want to listen to them, you're just going to conform to all the opinions of the world. You should dig deeper than that and figure out why you believe what you believe. Now, if you're in here in your 60s or 70s, let me just give you some news too. Your friends aren't that smart. <laughs> they've, they've made more mistakes than young people have. They've traveled a longer journey. But if they're not talking from the word of God, they're not that smart. Just because they've experienced something, they've got wisdom to share, and they can tweet something or they can post something does not make it right. Okay? In fact, in your small groups, I say this all the time. If you're in a small group setting and you're studying the Bible and somebody says, well, I think God feels this and this, forget that. I don't care what you think about God. What does God think about God? That's what we teach around here. All right? And so, listen, all this stuff, the collective wisdom of the culture, uh, all, all the sensuality, all the emotional uh, you know, blowing of the wind, all of that is conforming. And so here's the question. In 2016, are you going to conform to the world? Are you going to fit the mold? Are you going to shape your life the way it says to shape it? Are you going to be different? Are you going to look like everybody else at school? Are you going to walk like them, talk like them, act like them, have the same goals? Are you going to look like everybody else in the corporate world? Are you just going to look like every other state farmer that there is? Are you going to be like every other homeschool mom? You're going to be like every other parent of young kids or parent of teenagers. What are you going to live like in 2016? Are you going to conform or are you going to be different? Last part of Romans 6.13 says, you can present your, your bodies as sin instruments to unrighteousness, or you present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Your members to God as instruments of righteousness. See, again, I'm back to that by the mercies of God. Here's why I want to live different than the world, because the world has not done anything for me. Jesus has brought me from death to life. So, I want to be this other word, transformed. That's the other word. Don't be conformed, be transformed. This is another great word, uh, and I, I love this. I love this about the Bible, because, you know, there are smart dudes and I've studied the Bible professionally for 30 years. I know a lot of stuff about the Bible. There's a lot of deep theology. There's guys 15 million times smarter than me, and they can study theology, but the, the stuff that really matters in the Bible, a second grader can understand it, and this is one of those. Paul uses this word that has the word metamorphosis in it. Let me lay some deep theology on you. God wants us to be transformed. He wants us to change from caterpillars to butterflies. That's the word metamorphosis. Or, if you're really, really cool, from tadpoles to frogs. I like butterflies better than frogs, so I go with that one. That's what he's saying. God wants to take who you are spiritually on the inside, your caterpillar inside self, and turn you into a butterfly spiritually. Now, you might think that's simplistic, but that is the deep theology of this passage. Be transformed. Look differently. Be differently. The same person, but different appearance. And that begins with renewal of your mind. And it begins with a renewal of a mindset. 
This is not even the sermon. This is extra stuff. But we need to think differently if we're going to be transformed. If you're going to be transformed, you can't keep thinking like a caterpillar. You have to think like a butterfly. That's what it says, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this word, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. He will transform, transform our caterpillar into butterfly. That's what he's going to do. So stop looking at things through butterf- or caterpillar eyes and the world's eyes, because this is not your home. It says in Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. In other words, start changing the way you see things. That's the first change of mind. Then you renew your mind. You change it for the better. See, much of American Christianity, unfortunately, and we experience this here you know, personally, is that we think going to church makes us good people, makes us Christian. And, uh, and we think that this is kind of our spiritual act of worship. It's what we do. And don't get me wrong. You should come to church every Sunday because you should be together with the saints and you should encourage the saints and you should build the body of Christ up. But here's the bottom line. We need to know who God is and who Jesus is, not just come and sit in service after service after service. He wants us to renew our thinking. Think differently in 2016. So I want, I want you to commit to being here every Sunday. Why would I say to come here every Sunday? Because every Sunday we open this word and we talk for at least 35 minutes about what God wants us to know about him. Okay, let me just sit, pause for just a moment. If you've been here the last eight years at Eastview Christian Church, you've studied through Genesis, Deuteronomy, through Ruth, through Psalms, through Luke and Acts, and through seven epistles of the Apostle Paul. So guess what? You're starting to change the way you think, but that's not enough. We want you to be in small groups. We want you to get into a study group with people who are going to study, guess what? The Bible again. We're going to learn together what God expects from us, what he needs from us, what he wants for this world. And then, guys, I just want to encourage you this. You know I'm a Bible guy. Would 2016 just be a year that you are in this word every day? It's the only way you're going to change your thinking. It's the only way that you're going to think differently if you're in the Word of God and you know what he says. So many people in America go to church and have no idea what God says. And so let's make this a year that's different for us. We have all kinds of resources. You can go to our website for resources, bookstore resources, right out this door to my right. You can go to Right Now Media and get thousands of resources. You can do daily Bible readings. readings. If you're in here and you've slacked off on that, Get a Bible study plan and read the Bible every day this year. If you're new to the faith, last week we had 41 baptisms in our services. It was a really awesome Sunday, right? It was really cool. But they're babies in Christ. They're not going to read 17 chapters a day. So start with something else. Do a verse. Do two or three verses. Get online. There's an embarrassment of, of plans that you can read the Bible every day in the next year. Let me encourage you to be in the Word because that is what God thinks, and that's how we renew our minds, okay? But I want to warn you about something. This transformation is more than just knowledge. It's knowledge that we put into practice by testing. See that word there? Another cool word. By the way, I could preach this passage for about seven sermons. So many cool things in here. But this word testing is the Greek word dokimadzo. In the first century, if you went to the Roman uh, the Roman Agora, the, the place where they were trading and selling and buying things, uh, you, they used this word. They had coins that are real and coins that are fake, and the way you tested whether something's counterfeit or not was this word. You test it. They had first century tests to see whether a coin was real, authentic, or wasn't. It was a counterfeit or not. Dokimadzo. Paul says, listen, I want you to dokimadzo. I want you to test the stuff of the world based on your knowledge of God. I can illustrate this. Let me show you a modern interpretation of this word. See these two $20 bills? One is a counterfeit and one is not. Now, unless you work for a financial institution or a bank, there's no way that you can look at this and you can tell which one's which. And we're not going to play guess which one in church this morning. Okay? But just look at them. One of them is real and one of them is fake, and they look remarkably the same. But if you could hold them, there are tests, there's dokimazo, 
that you could do to tell which one's real and which one's fake. You've seen people in public at the checkout lines use markers. They'll mark on a $20 bill. That's because there is a cotton fiber that's used in the real $20 bills that, and no starches that are not used in counterfeits, and they can see by the color. You look at these $2 bills, you could also hold them up to the light and you could look for a watermark that you can only see through the light that's only on a real dollar bill or a security thread that runs up and down through these $2 bills. Now, you gotta focus back on the sermon again because I'm not gonna tell you which is real and which is counterfeit. (laughs) Because I want you to get this point. Counterfeit and real look an awful lot alike. And I think that most of us spend our lives walking through this culture and going, that looks good. That looks right. That seems right. That feels right. Everybody's saying that's right. But if it's counterfeit, it's counterfeit. The reason we know stuff about God from his word is so that we can test what's real and what's not real. That's what Ephesians 5.10 says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's why Philippians 1, 9, and 10 says, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is re- excellent and so be pure and blameless. In other words, the Christian in the first century was asked to do this. Hey, know God and then walk through life testing everything, seeing what's real and what's counterfeit. You know, back in the 1900s, they had this bracelet that came out, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And It kind of became a joke after a while, but it really is a great question to ask. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus go on vacation to the Dead Sea and take selfies? It's probably not in here, okay? Would Jesus own a Porsche? It's not in here, okay? What would Jesus do? There's some questions that you can answer very clearly from Scripture. What does Jesus think about marriage? What does Jesus think about divorce? What does Jesus think about lots of money and being selfish hoarding things? What does Jesus think about relationships? What does Jesus think about language? What does Jesus think about the poor? You can answer a lot of Jesus questions here. And my prayer for us in 2016 is that we know this so well that when we see the fraud of this world, we can look at it and go, oh, that's fake. Because they work hard at commercials, making everybody that drives the car, everybody that has the gadget, look smiley and happy and skinny and perfect. And we look at them and we go, yes, that's me. It's not you. It's counterfeit. And the better you and I get at matching what God says against what the world says, we'll be able to tell the counterfeit. You see the the last word here in this passage? This is the goal, perfect. And I know some of you are going, hey, hey, that's not fair because nobody's perfect. I can't be perfect, it's too big of a goal. Well, you need to understand what this word means in the first century. This word literally means to be fully mature, to come to the fullness of who you're supposed to be. And we've already said, you're not supposed to be a caterpillar. The fullness of what God has in plan in store for you is something way more glorious. And so Paul says, listen, here's what happens. When you begin to transform your mind and you begin to test what is real and what not real according to God, then you begin to mature. That's what the word perfect means. You begin to go on in your faith. You you cooperate with the Holy Spirit's how we say it around here, and you begin to grow. And I'm, I'm praying in 2016 for all of us here as a church that we use this year to grow. We cooperate with the Spirit that lives in us to go, you know what? I'm gonna know more about God this year. I'm gonna read the Bible more this year. I'm gonna give more this year. I'm gonna serve in this church more. I'm gonna serve people outside of this church more. I'm going to go on a missions trip this year. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to share my faith this year. I'm going to win someone to Christ this year. What is your spiritual goal? Because God wants you to progress. And he will, help, he will by his Holy Spirit, help you to do it if you'll transform your thinking and your mind. Here's what it says. I love this verse from 2 Corinthians 3.17. We all, with unveiled faces, behold the glory of the Lord. And we are being listen, transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God wants you to get closer to who he made you to be in 2016. He doesn't want you to stay the same. He wants you to mature and become perfect in his sight. So in this coming year, I pray that that's your goal, that you will join me in growing in your faith. Earlier in this service, you were given an opportunity to symbolically 
present yourself to God as a gift. And I see that several of you did. And maybe you're holding on to your tag still and you didn't come forward. That's okay. My prayer is that this coming year will be you, your life, your name written and given to God as a daily sacrifice so that we can become the people of God. We want the elders of this church, the leaders of this church, I am praying that this year we become a church that looks less like the world at the end of the year and more like Jesus Christ. And so if you would, I'm going to ask you all to join me, to stand and join me in prayer. I'm going to pray for us as we dismiss today that God would make us the people that he wants us to be. God, in light of your great mercies, because of all the work you've done to pursue us, to love us, to save us through your son, Jesus Christ, and because you have placed your spirit in us, Lord, we want to be transformed. We don't want to be conformed. So, Lord, in every heart here today, help us to see where we're conforming to the world and change it. In every heart here today, see where we need to transform our lives for you and help us by your Holy Spirit accomplish it in the coming year for your glory, for your name, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.